Hi, my name is Tiago Taira, and I'm a researcher in Göttingen, uh, the University Medical Center. And I also have the pleasure of being a visiting professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So I'll tell you about uh, some of our recent work on the study of molecular mechanisms associated with synucleinopathies, such as Parkinson's disease. And um, our research interests actually focus on the, the study of what happens to proteins inside cells. So we all know it's possible to study proteins in vitro as purified uh, entities, but to study protein folding and homeostasis in the context of a living cell is much harder. And this is uh, because the intracellular environment is extremely crowded, causing many problems for proteins as, as they are produced. So many of them, as we know today, end up never becoming uh, functional and never becoming properly folded. And the cell needs to decide quickly what to do with these proteins that are not, uh, um, not going the right pathway towards uh, folding. So um, it's important to keep in mind this idea that uh, what we find in vitro is perhaps a bit different than what we find in, vi in vivo or in the context of a cell, as I said. And uh, we need to understand how cells find these misfolded and aggregated proteins. So imagine a crowded environment like this one shown here that we all know from textbooks. So cells need to identify Wally or identify the misfolded uh, proteins. And uh, when this doesn't happen efficiently, we know that it, it can lead to problems. And this is associated with a variety of human diseases from diabetes to cancer, to neurodegeneration. And here I show you just some of the, the, the more common um, types of neurodegenerative diseases, of which Alzheimer's is, of course, the, the, the most common, followed by Parkinson's and by other diseases. And what you see is that uh, next to the names of each of these diseases, you, you find these little micrographs that represent a typical protein aggregates that you find inside the brains of patients that had these disorders. So you can think about the problem as uh, something that happens to proteins that, that changes their normal three-dimensional structure that may lead to the accumulation of protein aggregates. And uh, traditionally in recent years, we've been thinking that this was primarily perhaps due to a gain of toxic function, that these aggregates became toxic and could, could cause problems. Um, but we need to consider that if we change the normal three-dimensional structure of a protein, we will also affect its normal function. So most likely it is both a combination of loss and gain of toxic function that ultimate, ultimately contributes to disease. So in the context of the diseases I study, the synucleinopathies, we tend to focus on a protein called alpha-synuclein that gives the name to the diseases. And this is a protein we've known already for quite some time. Uh, we know that there are mutations uh, that lead to familial forms of Parkinson's disease, although these are rare. And we know, uh, we have some ideas about the function of the protein, although uh, primarily in neurons, we don't know what this protein is doing in other tissues, such as the blood. And we also have some ideas about possible post-translational modifications that the protein undergoes. But this is important because if we want to understand why this protein becomes toxic, assuming it becomes toxic and how it causes diseases, how it accumulates in these Lewy bodies. I mean, we need to think that proteins are not just the primary sequence that we know from the gene. And what this means is that uh, proteins undergo, uh, all proteins undergo post-translation modifications that determine the folding, the localization, and the function of proteins. And so you can think of any protein, your favorite protein, uh, alpha-synuclein in my case, and uh, we know that it will undergo modifications during its lifetime inside cells. And what we think is that in the context of some proteins like intrinsically disordered proteins, like, uh, like alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's, tau and A-beta in Alzheimer's disease, Huntington in uh, Huntington's disease, is that this group of modifications that the proteins will undergo may at some point cause uh, conformational changes that may trigger aggregation. So recently, and because we know that alpha-synuclein is associated with different synucleinopathies, um, the idea could be that perhaps there's different modifications that will determine the fate 
of alpha synuclein, perhaps leading to the formation of aggregates with slightly different properties that may then uh, explain why this protein may be found in different cell types and in, in different uh, um, uh, subcellular lo locations. And this may be important for uh, pathology. So with this in mind, we started uh, several years ago investigating uh, different post-translation modifications of alpha synuclein, And we were asking whether this had physiological roles, pathological roles. Uh, we were interested in uh, studying the enzymes involved, uh, what were the toxic forms, the modified or non-modified forms, and whether these modifications uh, uh, took place before or after the accumulation in uh, inclusions. So one of these modifications we think is particularly interesting because we think it may uh, provide some insight into this connection that we still don't understand in detail between diabetes and Parkinson's disease. We know that uh, diabetes patients have increased risk for developing Parkinson's disease, uh, and this is age dependent, but we don't know the molecular connection between these two diseases. So we think that this may have to do, at least in part, with this modification called glycation. So glycation is a non-enzymatic reaction of proteins with sugars, uh, and this is different than glycosylation, the, the, the modifications that happen uh, along the secretory pathway in the ER and then in the Golgi uh, to target proteins for uh, uh, the extracellular space or for the membrane. So glycation is non-enzymatic and usually leads to the formation of uh, glycation and, uh, and uh, advanced glycation end products or AGEs that are typically irreversible. So this is a, a, a series of complex reactions that ends up damaging proteins. And we know that um, glycation takes place in diabetes. Uh, we actually use this as a marker for diabetes by measuring glycated hemoglobin in the blood of patients with diabetes. So uh, it's likely that other proteins will be glycated as well. And with this in mind, a few years ago, we, we published a study where we looked um, in the blood of patients with Parkinson's disease or controlling individuals for different post-translation modifications. And um, this is important because it could give us clues that the, the, the pool of alpha synuclein in the blood may be used as a biomarker if it indeed reports on changes that take place in disease. So for, for this study, we basically took advantage of the thermal stability of the protein. We basically uh, boil the protein lysate and we can uh, get rid of most proteins because alpha synuclein is thermostable. And we had to get rid also of hemoglobin, which is highly abundant in order to detect alpha synuclein. And then in the end, uh, after all these steps, we can really uh, enrich in, uh, in alpha synuclein that we can easily detect with Western blot or dot blot. And using simple experiments, using uh, uh, Western blots with di different antibodies for different modifications, we could detect uh, glycation, sumorylation, phosphorylation of tyrosine 125 and nitration of tyrosine 39, both by Western blot and by uh, dot blot. So then what we did was to correlate uh, the levels of these modifications with disease and disease duration in particular. And interestingly, we found that for some modifications like glycation, we could detect an increase. So the, the, the levels of alpha synuclein glycated were increased in, in disease, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and others like simulation seem to be decreased. So this now gives us some ideas of what types of modifications to look for in Parkinson's patients um, and, 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 and hopefully uh, be able to develop biomarkers that will distinguish controls from disease individuals. But now what I want to focus on is on the study of the molecular alterations that take place in glycation. And uh, we know glucose metabolism produces methylglyoxal. Um, and methylglyoxal is a highly reactive dicarbonyl that uh, can react with certain amino acid side chains, uh, damaging the proteins. So uh, there's other glycating agents. Um, basically, any sugar can be a glycating agent, but methylglyoxal is definitely a major glycating agent that, as I said, can react with arginines, lysines, or both with arginines and lysines, and uh, generate 
um, products that we can measure, we can detect using different methods. So we found that in cells, in human cells or in brain tissue from animals, we can detect the presence of glycated uh, alpha synuclein by methylglyoxal. And we found different lysine residues in alpha synuclein that we, we, we detect to be glycated. And here I show you which are those residues. Those are the ones shown in red. And what you can see is that they, they tend to localize in the end terminal region of the protein. Alpha synuclein has 15 lysines. So the ones in yellow, we did not find to be glycated, but the ones in red were um, more likely to be glycated uh, in alpha synuclein. And, uh, and then what we did was to use a series of model systems in order to try to understand what glycation could be doing. And using uh, patient-derived IPS cells from uh, actually patients that carry a triplication of the alpha synuclein gene. So these are Parkinson's patients, and you see that they express alpha synuclein at higher levels. And we treated these cells or control cells where we knock down uh, alpha synuclein back to control levels. And we found that exposing these cells to increasing concentrations of methylglyoxal increased cytotoxicity. So you see here the control in black and the cells exposed that, that had a triplication of alpha synuclein are more sensitive to methylglyoxal. But then if we knock down um, alpha synuclein, we reduce the cytotoxicity induced by methylglyoxal. That was also true in vivo. So here what we did was we took either wild type animals here on the left hand side or alpha synuclein transgenic animals and we injected methylglyoxal on one side of the brain or PBS on the contralateral side of the brain and we stained for tyrosine hydroxylase, um, which is a marker of dopaminergic neurons uh, in the substantia nigra. And what we found was that in the animals that are transgenic for alpha synuclein, so they express higher levels of synuclein, the number of, or the, 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 the reactivity for TH was reduced significantly. So these animals uh, tend to, to lose more dopaminergic neurons than, um, than the control animals uh, injected with methylglyoxal. And using a, a series of in vitro studies with recombinant protein, we found that uh, adding increasing concentrations of methylglyoxal reduced what seemed to be amyloid fiber formation by alpha synuclein. So this was a bit surprising. We were thinking that perhaps we, we would see an increase in aggregation. But then when we used complementary techniques like size explosion, chromatography, or electron microscopy, we found that indeed the size of the species we were obtaining upon glycation was increasing, but they were not forming the, the typical amyloid structure that we, we know just from incubating alpha synuclein uh, over time. And we detected the accumulation of these species that are uh, compatible with oligomeric species that others have described in the literature. So what we think is that glycation, which could be taking place at different steps of the aggregation process, is probably promoting the accumulation of oligomers and not necessarily the amyloid fibrils. And a few years ago, we, we had uh, used uh, a functional readout of neural uh, plasticity, uh, basically treating hippocampal um, slices from rat brains with different um, pools of alpha synuclein, different species, either monomers, oligomers, or fibrils. And we found that the oligomers, but not monomers or fibrils, impaired long-term potentiation. And then eventually, doing a series of other studies, we found that this was uh, due to uh, impairments of NMDA receptor um, uh, calcium influx. And uh, what we did this time was simple. So if we, since we knew this was a readout of uh, the, the effect that oligomers had on uh, neuronal uh, transmission, we asked whether glycated alpha synuclein with MGO would uh, also impact on um, synaptic plasticity. And indeed, that's what we found. So you see here the quantification. So the slices that were treated with glycated alpha synuclein had uh, uh, reduced long-term potentiation, suggesting that indeed these species were toxic oligomers. Now what we're doing is to uh, uh, study the glycation of alpha synuclein by other sugars. We think methylglyoxal is interesting as a, as a, as a model uh, agent, but we think there might be other sugars that could be more physiologically relevant. And in this context, we've been looking at uh, ribose, glucose, 
mannose, galactose, or a series of other sugars and incubating alpha-synuclein in vitro with these uh, sugars. And uh, by using a simple reaction that can be monitored mm -hmm. using fluorescence, um, we could detect indeed that when we incubate alpha-synuclein with methyl dioxide, we detect some glycation. But then, for example, ribose mm -hmm. seems to glycate alpha-synuclein uh, even to a higher extent. And other sugars like glucose or galactose do not seem to be as potent in uh, uh, promoting the formation of this type of fluorescent products. Now, using mass spectrometry analysis of alpha synuclein incubated with these different sugars, we could again detect glycation of different lysine residues with, with all these different sugars, but the extent of uh, glycation was different and it was stronger for methyl glyoxide. And what we could also see uh, by using again thioflavin T as a readout for amyloid formation and electron microscopy, we could see that uh, uh, as we had observed before, methyl glyoxide reduces thioflavin T binding as does ribose, but other sugars uh, surprisingly like glucose and galactose do not seem to reduce viral formation as much. And you can see that this is uh, compatible with the observations uh, with electron microscopy where we see with galactose the formation of fibrils, the formation of uh, fibrillar species that may not be mature amyloid fibrils but are definitely different than the ones formed with methyl And this was also confirmed using a filter trap uh, assay uh, that confirmed that the, the different types of glycated alpha-synuclein had different physical properties, different sizes that could be retained by a filter. Um, we confirmed this also using um, different, uh, different readouts, native gels applied and where we could see different smears uh, and also uh, using uh, antibodies like the, the uh, Michael J. Fox antibody 14642 uh, that detects aggregated alpha-synuclein. We could detect reactivity on a dot plot suggesting that um, indeed these were aggregates that uh, were increased in size, but were probably not mature amyloid fibrils. And what we've been investigating more recently is uh, whether these glycated alpha synuclein species can seed uh, the, the aggregation of uh, non-glycated um, or endogenous alpha synuclein. And for this, what we did was to use uh, SHSY5Y cells that we could differentiate into uh, TH uh, positive neurons or yeah, neuronal cells, I should say. And uh, we added glycated alpha synuclein or non glycated alpha synuclein to these cultures. And then we used uh, uh, different markers of aggregation. So we stained, we could see that when we looked for alpha synuclein inside the cell, we could detect that there was some internalization. And um, we could detect some signal that told us that indeed there was seeding of endogenous uh, alpha synuclein aggregation. And what we use as a readout is this phosphorylation of serine 129. Here, these are primary cortical neurons, so not just the SHSY5Y cells, but you can see that the signal, the red signal, is, demonstrates that there is seeding from the exogenous seeds that were added of the endogenous material because the the, the, the phosphorylation of serine 129 can only take place inside cell. And when we add, for example, alpha synuclein glycate with MGO, we can detect phosphorylation, so it seeds aggregation. But interestingly, uh, ribose glycated alpha synuclein would not uh, uh, induce the seeding of endogenous protein. So it's interesting that different glycated forms of the protein can, can have different uh, capabilities for seeding aggregation of endogenous protein. Um, we've also been investigating whether these different glycated species could induce inflammatory responses. And for this, what we did was to prepare primary microglial cultures and then treat the cells again with the glycated alpha synuclein by different agents. And we could see that glycated alpha synuclein, both by methyl glyoxal or by ribose, induces. Uh, the, 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 the levels of IL-6, NF-alpha, IL-1-beta. So this is compatible with uh, an inflammatory response triggered by glycated alpha-synuclein. Uh, 
And more recently, uh, one avenue we are pursuing is the generation of antibodies against glycated alpha synuclein. So there are no easy ways for detecting glycation of alpha synuclein unless you do mass spec, and uh, uh, or if you use general antibodies for glycated residues. So we wanted to develop tools that may enable us to detect glycated forms of alpha synuclein. And for this, we, we started just by generating polyclonal antibodies. So we immunized uh, rabbits with peptides of alpha synuclein that were uh, uh, labeled um, with, uh, that, uh, that were incubated with methylglyoxal for glycation, or we also uh, injected rabbits with full length glycated alpha synuclein. And we used peptides shown here. This was peptide one, peptide two uh, started with KTK. And, and we, we have antibodies that uh, recognize glycated alpha synuclein, as we could confirm here uh, on Western blots. So this is just a general alpha synuclein Western blot uh, uh, with the, 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 the antibody for total glycated alpha synuclein, and you can detect signals. And the antibodies for the glycated peptides can also detect signals of alpha synuclein, uh, confirming that it, it detect, they detect glycated protein. So this is where we're going uh, because we think this is really important and it could be uh, uh, um, giving us clues for possible targets for therapeutic intervention. And uh, what we think is that diabetes or glycation could constitute one of these environmental factors that could tip the proteostasis balance in synuclein and pr probably, most likely, in other neurodegenerative diseases as well. So it's important to understand how glycation and other post-translation modifications alter uh, protein structure, protein function, in order to come up with better uh, ideas for targets for intervention. And with this, I would like to close thanking members of my lab that contributed to these studies, collaborators over the years that have helped us in these uh, different studies and the sources of funding, and of course, you for your attention. So thank you.